From the mysteries of the deep to the power of human innovation, the future of our oceans is in our hands. Together, we can protect the oceans that sustain us all. Join me on a journey of discovery, innovation and change. Let's create a future where our oceans are safe, healthy and harmonious. This is Harmonious Oceans. Hey everyone, welcome to Harmonious Oceans. If you're all about saving our planet and oceans, you're definitely in the right spot. Today, we're kicking off with a super exciting series where we dive into 10 major challenges our ocean face. Using the word harmonious. And for the first video, we're starting off strong with a big one. Halting ocean acidification. Now I know that sounds like a mouthful, but trust me, it's something we all need to know about. So, let's get into it. Ocean acidification might sound like something straight out of a sci-fi movie, but it's very real and it's happening right now. Here's the deal. Since the Industrial Revolution, we've been loading the atmosphere with tons of carbon dioxide from things like cars, factories, and basically all of the cool stuff we've built to make life easier. But here's the catch. The oceans are soaking up a lot of this CO2 and that's where the trouble starts. A lot of the CO2 dissolves into the ocean. Water and carbon dioxide combine to form carbonic acid, a weak acid that dissociates or breaks into hydrogen ions and bicarbonate ions. Over time, this is making our oceans more acidic. The pH of the ocean has dropped by 0.1 units since the Industrial Revolution. Now, you might think 0.1, that's nothing. But because the pH scale is logarithmic, that tiny drop actually means a 30% increase in acidity. So yeah, it is kind of a big deal. So, why should we care? Well, this extra acidity is messing up with marine life, especially the little guys like oysters, clams and corals that rely on calcium carbonate to build their shells and skeletons. Imagine trying to build a house, but your bricks are literally dissolving in your hands. That's what's happening to these creatures. And it's not just them. This affects the entire ocean ecosystem, which eventually trickles down to us. Now that we know a little bit more about ocean acidification, let's talk about why it's such a big problem. Some people call it osteoporosis of the sea. And that's a pretty spot on comparison. Just like osteoporosis weakens bones, ocean acidification weakens the shells and skeletons of marine life. But it doesn't just stop there. The changing ocean chemistry messes with the behavior of fish too. For example, studies show that fish like clownfish, yeah like Nemo, can't detect predators as well or find their way home in more acidic waters. And if the little fish are in trouble, the bigger fish that eat them are in trouble too. It's a chain reaction that could throw the entire marine food web out of whack. And here's a mind-blowing fact. Our oceans have absorbed between a third and a half of the CO2 we've released into the atmosphere since 1850. That's helped slow down climate change, but it's come at a huge cost. The acidity of our oceans has increased by 26% since then, which is happening about 10 times faster than anything in the last 55 million years. Marine life just can't keep up with this pace, and that could put spell disaster for everything, from coral reefs to the fish on your dinner plate. As young people, we have a unique voice and energy that can really make a difference. So, what can we do? 1. Cut down on carbon. It might seem like a broken record, but cutting down on our carbon footprint really matters. Drive less, walk or bike more, use public transport, and push for renewable energy. 2. Raise awareness. Not everybody knows about ocean acidification, and spreading the word is key. Talk to your friends, your family, your teachers. Share what you learn on social media and get the conversation going. The more people know, the better. Get involved locally. Join local beach cleanups or campaigns to reduce single-use plastic. Cleaner oceans means less stress on marine life, and it's something we can all do together. Speak up for change. Support policies that aim to reduce carbon emissions and protect marine environments. Write to your local representatives, get involved in youth activism groups, or even start your own initiative. Every voice counts. 
Be a coastal maker. If you're lucky enough to live near the coast, get involved in projects that improve water quality, like planting seagrass beds or creating artificial reefs. This can help buffer the effects of acidification and protect local marine life. The issue is big, but a little awareness and small steps are instrumental in making a positive change. Many students are pursuing courses related to environmental issues and are actively looking for solutions. Recently, I had an interesting chat with Eamon Coates, who is a third year student currently reading chemistry at Oxford. He is interested in the application of chemistry to alternative energy sources and resource acquisition. Let's now hear from Eamon. How do you think chemistry can help solve environmental challenges? The unifying thread here is the management and reduction of waste in our society because we have a rapacious need for raw materials and every production line we have has a waste stream and we have to reduce the waste or put the waste to good use or re cycle the products to yeah. reduce our environmental impact. Everything that's destroying our planet right now is either a direct impact of how we're acquiring our raw materials or the waste we create in the process. When it comes to raw materials, some of them are having an extremely detrimental impact on things like global warming. For example, concrete production is accounts for 7.5% of all carbon dioxide emissions. That's like, if you consider the carbon output of individual countries, that puts yeah. concrete as the third biggest carbon emission in the world after the US and China. That's, right, yeah. that's, got, that's got to change. That's a huge issue that we have to address. Um, there is some progress being made. For example, a couple months ago, um, some UK researchers found a way to uh, recycle concrete and cement using waste heat from steel recycling plants uh, using electric arc furnaces. And that segues nicely onto steel, which is also a massive emitter of carbon. Um, if we can transition for away from the use of uh, blast furnaces powered by fossil fuels yeah. into the use of electric arc furnaces, powered by um, renewable electricity, we're slashing carbon emissions by a hell of a lot. Something like, instead of 2.6 tons of carbon dioxide per ton of steel produced, we're looking at 0 0.6 tons of carbon dioxide per wow. ton of steel yeah. produced. That's, that's a great reduction. And if we combine that with up and coming technologies um, to reduce the use of carbon-based reductants in the use uh, in the creation of steel we can reduce that even further for example um a group at the university of birmingham a couple of years ago discovered that you can create um a cycle within a steel mill using perovskites to um convert outgoing carbon dioxide into carbon monoxide which can then be cycled back through the furnace to reduce more um oh wow more iron ore yeah. into into steel that's amazing and you look at any sort of base material yeah and how its production usually ravages uh local environments there are emerging technologies which can revolutionize that the problem is just making implementing them making them economically viable um a big one to look out for in in the near future is nickel because currently the, our most used source of nickel is nickel sulfide ores. But um, once they run out, and they will, then the next largest ore will be laterite ore. And our current techniques for extracting nickel from that are just abominable. There are huge amounts of toxic chemicals, extremely energy intensive. If you look at Indonesia, which has the high, highest concentration of laterite ore, already its jungles are being completely ravaged, just completely clear cut to make way for nickel mining. Progress is being made in lithium. For example, um, we now know how to use electrodialysis to directly extract lithium from low quality lithium brines. That is, um, 
aqueous solutions that we find, which contain small amounts of dissolved lithium, we can now extract that quite well, which is nice, um, using electrochemical methods instead of harsh reagents, which is always preferable. There are promising ways to recycle electronic um, things, recovered niobium, nickel, rare, rare earth metals from, from batteries and mobile phones. And um, some of these methods reduce other waste streams as well. So if you use a technique called bioleaching, which puts to use bacteria or fungi, which can uh, effectively digest metals out of material using uh, their sort of naturally produced enzymes and uh, acidic digestants. That's great. You're reducing two waste streams at once. It's brilliant. I think if there's one sort of broad umbrella to look at, it's electrochemistry and catalysis. Yeah. Every chemical process needs a good catalyst, and the right catalyst can make it infinitely more viable, more um, efficient. It's just a matter of finding that catalyst, which often is a matter of uh, trial and error. It's a matter of luck. And on the other hand, there's electrochemistry, which is an area of personal interest because instead of treating chemicals with harsh reagents instead of reducing a chemical species with a reducing agent which yeah. is probably going to create some nasty waste expensive to make and ship you can just persuade it to be reduced by electricity it's 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 like magic it takes the whole reagent aspect out of chemistry and makes everything happen just through some coming electrical potentials. Can you please share the importance of pH in a solution and its impacts? Here are Poirier diagrams for three um, elements which might cause environmental contamination. Cerium, uranium, and plutonium. Uh, cerium often enters the environment from uh, rare earth mining operations sort of from tailing ponds, stuff like that. And uranium and plutonium might find their way into the environment from uh, nuclear reactors, stuff like that. Um, if we just focus on plutonium as a case in point, what we can deduce from this diagram is that if we take, if you look at the region of the diagram that says PuO2, um, plutonium dioxide, which is solid, say that... Um, the system it's in is neither oxidizing nor reducing, so the electrode potential is zero. Yeah. If you have a bunch of plutonium dioxide at the bottom of a lake or something, that's okay. It's not going to contaminate anything because it's, it's, a, it's a lump of rock just sitting there. But if you decrease that pH, you can see that it crosses a phase boundary and becomes aqueous plutonium 3+. So if that lake acidifies, all of a sudden you've got a problem on your hands because that plutonium is going to dissolve and start contaminating the ecosystem. Yeah. And that's, that's just a totally random example of how pH is an important factor on the environment, specifically in the context of human waste. Um, another big thing to be aware of uh, with regard to pH is acid runoff from mines. Um, when we dig up things like pyrites, which are sulfide minerals, those are our mo most major sources of iron and copper. Uh, whereas they've been living underground with no exposure to air or moisture for millions of years, once you open up that mine and those sulfide minerals start oxidizing, uh, you get sulfuric acid evolved. If any moisture finds its way into those mines, which it usually does because it's below the water table, 
yeah. that's going to wash out highly acidic media into the surrounding ecosystem, which is very, very nasty. Are there any simple steps we can take to raise awareness about environmental challenges? I think far and away, the most important thing is the power of writing. Develop your writing skill and learn how to communicate science to everyone. Join a society at uni and try and spread its reach. Get people involved. Um, Find people doing in interesting research and annoy them for mm -hmm. advice, uh, help, what have you. Um, when it comes to raising awareness, though, the first step is to raise your own awareness first, because you can't raise other people's awareness if you have no awareness. So we just heard how chemistry can help to solve the environmental challenges the world is currently facing. Science and engineering are coming up with some amazing ideas to help combat ocean acidification. Here are a couple that really make the waves. First, Planetary Technologies. This company is doing something seriously awesome. They're taking mine waste, turning it into antacid, safe antacid, and releasing it into the ocean. This antacid helps neutralize the acid in the water and speeds up the ocean's ability to absorb CO2. Plus. They're producing clean hydrogen as a byproduct, which can be used as green fuel. They're basically tackling three major issues all in one. Removing CO2, reducing ocean acidity, and producing renewable energy. The second one, chloride-mediated CO2 removal. This one's still in the early stages, but it sounds super promising. It's a process that uses special electrodes to capture CO2 directly from seawater. It's cost-effective, efficient, and could be scaled up to remove massive amounts of CO2. If it works out, it could help reverse some of the damage we've done to our oceans. Whether it's making small changes in our daily lives, supporting cutting-edge technologies, or getting involved in activism, there's a lot we can do to protect our oceans. Our oceans are a huge part of what makes the Earth so special. By halting ocean acidification, we're not just saving marine life, we're protecting our future and the health of our planet. Thanks for hanging out with me on Harmonious Oceans. If you found this video helpful or inspiring, make sure to like, share and subscribe. Let's keep the conversation going and work together to keep our oceans clean and vibrant. See you next time!